Hello, I'm Kate Rayworth, and this is an introduction to the core concepts of donut economics. What motivated me to write donut economics was a frustration with the concepts at the heart of my own economics education, concepts that are still far too often taught today. Because at the heart of what I'm going to call 20th century economics and its mindset are core images that show us the underlying ideas of what the economy is and who it's for and who we are and what success looks like. And these, I believe, do not equip us for the reality and challenges ahead. In the 20th century economic mindset, the first image that is so often still taught is the supply and demand of the market. This puts markets immediately at the center of our vision. It makes price the fundamental metric of concern. And it means that anything that falls outside of a market contract is called an externality. This is far, far too narrow a starting point for today's economic thinking. The biggest picture is known as the circular flow of income and goods with households and businesses in the essential market relationship and some leakages and reinjections via banks, governments and trade. The fundamental point about this diagram is that it makes absolutely no account for energy or the material basis of the economy. It says nothing about unpaid caring work that makes labour fresh and ready for work every day. And it's silent on the commons. So this diagram is too small and does not take account of everything that matters for the health of an economy. The self-portrait of humanity at the heart of this 20th century economic mindset, it's rational economic man and he would look something like this. He would be a man standing alone with money in his hand, ego in his heart, a calculator in his head and nature at his feet. He hates work, he loves luxury, he knows the price of everything. The tragic fact of this character is not only how absurdly narrow he is, but that on being told that he is like us, we actually start to become more like him. Students over time say that they more value competition over collaboration. They value self-interest over altruism. So who we tell ourselves we are shapes who we'll become. We need a new portrait of humanity. And the goal, the goal of 20th century economic thought, it's so deeply rooted it's never drawn, but it underlies every economist's lecture and politician's speech. The goal is endless growth measured in GDP or national income. Economies growing no matter how rich they already are, the idea is that they will succeed by yet more growth. Add to this two fundamental beliefs that were dominant in the second half of the 20th century about economic dynamics on inequality. The Kuznets curve, based off the work of Simon Kuznets in the mid 20th century, seemed to imply that as countries get richer, first inequality will increase, but then it will decrease. This promises that growth will even things up again. It turns out not to be true, but it has underpinned over 50 years of trickle down theory of grow now and even things up later. When it comes to the environment, the environmental Kuznets curve created in the 1990s seemed to tell a similar story that as countries get richer, pollution will at first increase, but then it will fall. And this underpinned the promise that growth will clean things up again, except it doesn't. Because when we take account not only of local pollutants, but global pollutants, that curve does not bend down naturally at all. So these ideas about the dynamics of the economy, that growth will even things up again and growth will clean things up again, gave great legitimacy for the pursuit of growth. But it turns out that these dynamics do not hold. I believe these core concepts together have played a powerful role in shaping the economy that we have created. And so the 21st century has begun with repeated crises from financial meltdown in 2008. We live in an era of climate and ecological breakdown, which has given rise to protesters against whom there is crackdown. And we lived through years of COVID lockdown. Now, these crises are reported separately in the news, but they are deeply interconnected. They show us how connected we are with each other and with the rest of the living world. They show us that they hit with great inequalities of gender and of race, of wealth and power between the global north and the global south. And they show us that systems based on endless expansion will create their own feedback effects. If you create a financial system that aims to endlessly expand, 
you will create a bubble that will pop. If we create a system of energy and material use of endless expansion, we will induce climate and ecological breakdown. And if we have a system of human settlements ever pushing into areas of wildlife, coupled with ever increasing global travel, we create perfect conditions for zoonotic disease transfer and pandemics. Can we move away from thinking that the shape of progress is endless growth and expansion? Can we find a different vision? And that is what Donut Economics aims to do. So here are the seven ways to think like a 21st century economist set out in the book. In this presentation, I'm going to cover some of these seven ways to thread them together as the beginnings of a 21st century story. Let's start with what we could take as the first picture in economics, and it should be the goal. What is the economy for? What is our purpose? If we don't know that, how will we ever know what success looks like? So the donut acts as a possible compass for human prosperity in the very broadest sense. And as you can see here in this image, the essence of it is that we should leave no one in the hole facing critical levels of human deprivation. But at the same time, as we use Earth's resources and means, we must not overshoot an ecological ceiling and cause critical planetary degradation. We need to seek to live in that safe and just space for humanity in between the two, and that is the donut-shaped space. How can we give specificity to the human deprivations and the planetary degradation? We can fill it in by creating a social foundation below which no one should fall short. And this is based on the Sustainable Development Goals because through the SDGs, all of the governments in the world have agreed that every person in the world has a claim to meeting their essential needs in terms of all these 12 social dimensions. That's why they've been crowdsourced from the Sustainable Development Goals. So leave no one falling short on the essentials of life in the hole in the middle of the donut. But as we collectively use Earth's resources, we must also make sure that we do not overshoot that ecological ceiling of the nine planetary boundaries identified by Earth system scientists first in 2009 as the critical life supporting systems that make life work on this delicately balanced planet that have held this planet in a stable space for the last 11,000 years, a space in which all human civilizations have been created and this is the space in which humanity can thrive. So the goal is instantly changed. It's no longer endless growth exponentially up a curve. It's thriving in balance between the social foundation and the ecological ceiling shown here. Very different shape of progress. When I first drew this diagram in 2012, I was amazed by the traction it had with people. And it led me to look at the visualization, the image of health, of thriving, of well-being that have been drawn by indigenous cultures worldwide for millennia. And it was so striking to see that again and again, this sense of a dynamic circle is a recurring feature. And so I now think of Donald Economics as a mindset recovery program for those with a Western industrial economic education. Can we recover from thinking that endless growth is progress? using the donut towards something that's been reflected in indigenous wisdoms for a very long time. Can the donut help be a bridge towards that? If thriving in balance is indeed where we want to get to, we are very far from that right now. As all of the red in this diagram shows, it shows that billions of people are falling short on the essentials of life, falling below the social foundation. For food, for example, that red wedge on food goes 11% of the way towards the center of the circle because 11% of people worldwide do not have enough food to eat every day. And you can see on every one of these social foundations, some are measured with one indicator, some are measured with two, the people are falling short on the essentials of life. We need to eliminate all of the red from the middle of this picture. But at the same time, we have already overshot multiple planetary boundaries on climate change, on excessive fertilizer use, on excessive land conversion, biodiversity loss. And indeed, scientists have recently updated this and recognize even on water withdrawals and on chemical pollution, we are also in overshoot. So we are living way beyond the boundaries. This is a world dangerously out of balance on both sides. What would it mean to come back into that space of balance? We see this news in the headlines every day. And it can be overwhelming. Can we remain sensitive and aware to the impact of 
what is happening to the earth, what is happening to her people, the extremes of inequality, the richest 1% of people own half of the world's wealth. I profoundly believe that our children and their children will judge our generation against this compass and will ask us, what did you do once that you knew, once that you saw this as the challenge that humanity faces? What role did you play in turning the story around? And let's recognize that last century's economic theories, last century's governmental policies and business models and lifestyles, none of them were designed to solve this problem. We need to create new economic models of our own. We need to create new governmental policies, new business models, new lifestyle aspirations and new relationships between the global north and the global south to turn this story around. So if getting into the donut is the goal, what kind of economic mindset would give us even half a chance of getting there? Let's start again with a new big picture of the economy. Let's call it the embedded economy because this diagram brings together ecological economics, feminist economics and commons theory to recognize that the economy is embedded in society structured by social, political, cultural and legal constructs. And human society itself is embedded in the living world, dependent upon those planetary boundaries with a stable climate and ozone and protection, nutrient cycle, fresh water, healthy oceans, thriving biodiversity and fertile soils. So the economy is a subset of society, is a subset of the living world, and it's bathed in a river of solar energy from the sun. The economy draws in living matter and materials and it puts out waste matter back into the biosphere. So right from day one, we have to ask the ecological economic question of how big can the through flow of the economy be so that it does not disrupt the cycles and the stability of biodiversity and Earth's systems. And then let's look within the economy itself and recognize that there are four fundamental ways in which we provision for our needs and wants. And within each of these, there are many different roles that we can and do play. Let's start with the market, which is defined by price based exchange, where you may be a consumer or a producer. And within that space of production, are you a laborer earning a wage or a capital owner earning the rents and profits? or you may be excluded from markets and destitute without access to them. Let's focus on the role of the state where one may be a resident accessing public services or a public servant providing them. You may be a voter or a protester, all fundamental roles we can play in relation to the state or may be stateless and not recognized. Now the market and the state in the 20th century became the dominant ideological boxing match between being a free market laissez-faire capitalist and a state-loving socialist. And in that ideological boxing match, it got so intense that economists lost sight of two other fundamental forms of provisioning for our needs and wants. There's the household where we all begin every day. We may be a parent or a child, a partner, a relative, or you may be kinless without that familial household support the unpaid caring work of cooking, washing, cleaning, sweeping, raising the children, doing it all again tomorrow. It's unpaid, but it's essential to our well-being. And then there's the commons, where we come together, not through the market or the state, but as a community to co-produce goods and services we value. Here you may be a commoner, a steward, a co-creator, a volunteer, or indeed excluded from access to the commons. And let's also recognize that there's the role of financial markets, financial flows moving between these different forms. In this space, one might be a creditor or a debtor, an investor or a speculator, or financially excluded without access to finance. So now we have the market, the state, the household and the commons and intermediated by financial flows. Of course, some of the most interesting and important action in an economy goes on at the synergy between these different forms. So market commons or the state and the commons. There are also power relationships between the market and the household, the market and the state, the state and the commons. I know that I wouldn't want to live in an economy that lacked any one of these four fundamental forms of provisioning because they all bring unique characteristics. But what are the skills to make them work well? What are the values and the traits of behavior 
that will enable us to create economies that provision for our needs and wants through these ways rather than concentrate value and opportunity and wealth in the hands of a few. And this is why it really matters how we think about human nature. We need to nurture the best of human nature because rational economic man, that character I introduced earlier, his traits that are ascribed to him in mainstream economics have been that he is self-interested, he has fixed preferences, he's not influenced by advertising but only informed by it, he's isolated in that he's independent from the preferences and actions of others, that he's ever calculating in his head uh, the percentage uh, opportunity or comparing price, all prices over all time, and that he's dominant over nature and the rest of the living world. The dangers of this model are that we start to become like this model. We start to mimic it and believe it true. In fact, we are social and adaptable humans. We are the most social of all mammals. And it is our connection to each other that greatly defines who we are and how we behave. So instead of imagining ourselves as merely self-interested, we should start by recognizing our social reciprocity. Instead of thinking we have fixed preferences, recognize that we have fluid values that can be triggered and amplified or withered and lost. Rather than thinking of ourselves as isolated, recognize that we're interdependent upon and with one another. Rather than imagining that we are ever calculating, we are actually approximating, we are heuristic beings. And rather than thinking of ourselves dominant over the rest of the living world, recognize that we are dependent upon it and part of the web of life. These are some of the steps and some of the changes that are taking place in reimagining and remaking human nature and bringing this far more realistic version of ourselves to the heart of new economic thinking. So how can humanity get into the donut? Let's recognize from this image that this is a deeply degraded world running down the life support systems of our planetary home in overshoot. It's also a deeply divided world in which billions of people can't meet their most essential needs and others are in overconsumption. So it's not going to be by believing that growth will even things up again because it won't. And it's not going to happen by believing that growth will simply clean up after itself because it won't. We need to change the dynamics of our economy. We need to become regenerative and distributive by design. So we've inherited linear degenerative economic systems where we take Earth's materials, we make them into stuff we want, we use it for a while and then we throw it away. And this take, make, use, lose, this is what pushes us over planetary boundaries, taking again and again from Earth's sources and throwing waste again and again into Earth's sinks. We must transform that linear degenerative process into a cyclical or circular regenerative process in which resources aren't used up, they're used again and again, far more carefully, collectively, creatively, and slowly, separating biological materials so that Earth can break them down through decomposition and build them again anew. This is how nature works. And separate those biological materials from technical human-made materials that won't decompose because we have transformed them in the way we've made them. And so they need to be refurbished and repaired and restored and reused and shared and as a last resort recycled but never thrown away because there is no away. So this is an economy that will work with and within the cycles of the living world. It's a move from degenerative to regenerative in, for example, agriculture, landscape degradation to landscape restoration and nature's generosity in coming back even when we have pushed her extremely to the edge. Nature is currently still generous and coming back in so many places. It's moving from degenerative linear manufacturing where we throw away waste in the neighborhoods of the world's poorest people to a creating a circular or cyclical repair-based, refurbishment, reuse-based manufacturing so that things are not being thrown away in the first place. It's moving from car-centered transport, such as this highway in Seoul in Korea, replacing that 10-lane highway with a river and a park, bringing nature back into the city, so literally regenerating the places we live, and down to the level of a building, 
compare this nature-less hospital in the UK to this nature-rich hospital in Singapore, which hospital would you prefer to heal and get well again in? We know that we heal much faster when we are connected to nature and see ourselves as part of this regenerative natural system. So at the same time as moving from degenerative to regenerative, we need to change deep dynamics of inequalities because we've inherited economic systems that through infrastructure, through law, through privilege, through regulation, they are tending to capture opportunity and value in the hands of a few. And this leads to the rise of a 1% in many countries nationally, certainly globally. We need to transform that divisive dynamic into one that is far more distributive by design, sharing opportunity and value with all who co-created. And that turns out to be the whole of society. Some examples of possible entry points for distributive design. Think of the contrast between the housing and rental crisis in cities like London, where many residents feel now that they will never be able to afford their own home because rents are so high and the market has been captured by many international and large-scale landlords who see housing as an investment asset. Contrast that with the city of Vienna, which has over 60% of its residents living in social housing, which is central, it's normal, it's affordable, it's good quality, because over 100 years ago, the city of Vienna decided that housing is not an investment asset, it's a human right, and decided to own the housing by the city and city-run cooperatives to make that possible. Think in terms of transport, contrasting a massive traffic jam of private cars in Beijing and many, many cities worldwide. Contrast that with the priority given to public transport in the city of Curitiba in Brazil, with dedicated bus lanes that make travelling by bus affordable, fastest, simplest way to get around. And it means that those coming in from distant suburbs actually reduce the excessive amount of time that they spend traveling. Very important time for lower income households to reclaim. Think of it in terms of from divisive to distributive forms of energy production from major companies, multinationals drilling for oil in the North Sea and many other parts of the world to community run and owned microgrids shown here in Kenya. Or think of it in terms of business. Moving from a very 20th century model where business has been driven by profit, but that's only one model of business. It can also be purpose-led, such as this handicraft company in Mumbai, in which the profits are shared far more equitably with all of the workers. So we're moving from degenerative to regenerative dynamics, from divisive to distributive dynamics. These will help to meet the needs of all people, simultaneously coming back within the means of the living planet. And of course, this raises the question of the future of economic growth. If the goal is to become regenerative and distributive by design, what does this mean for the future of growth? Let's just start by recognizing that the idea of endless economic growth has an absurdity within it, that no matter how rich a country already is, the idea that its success lies on yet more growth without end cannot make sense, especially on a delicately balanced living planet in which income, earning income and spending income cannot be fully de decoupled at all from energy and material use. In nature, nature's growth curve has an ex exponential phase. That's about growth being a healthy, dynamic part of the life cycle. But then it grows up and it comes to maturity and comes to plateau. Everything in nature thrives by following this growth path? Can we transform our economies so that they too learn not to aim to grow endlessly, but learn to grow up and start to thrive in balance? And of course, this is particularly relevant to high income countries that already have earned the income and the wealth and accumulation to lead good lives and to meet the needs of all people that already have massive ecological overshoot and have the obligation to move first and fastest to coming back within planetary boundaries. How can they remove their dependency on endless growth that has been currently written into their economies? So pulling back, 20th century economics centers concepts that do not serve the realities and the challenges of our times. Let's replace them with 21st century concepts that give us the donut as the goal to meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet, that recognize the economy 
is embedded in the society, embedded in the living world and utterly dependent upon them. That we need to bring forth all and that we need to that we need to nurture the best of human nature so that we recognize ourselves as social adaptable beings who can collaborate and steward and develop the skills and behaviors and values that will enable us to live well together over 8 billion people in the 21st century. We need to create dynamics in our economy that take us from being degenerative by design to regenerative by design, from being divisive by design to being distributive by design. And that means questioning the pursuit of endless growth and finding ways to end dependency on endless growth, especially in the higher income countries, so that instead of growing endlessly, they can start to learn to thrive. These are many of the seven ways to think like a 21st century economist. And at Donut Economics Action Lab, we explore what it would mean to put them into practice in the world of business, working with local governments and cities, in communities and in our own lives. And we invite you to explore these ways with us.